Today, I'd like to talk about how Mathematica can be used for zoology computation. So I'd like to begin with some goals for uh, what you might want for a platform for zoology computation. And for me, there are three. <clears throat> the first is completeness. So your platform or tool or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, should be able to cover everything you might want to know about zoology. You know, it makes sense. Second of all is automation. So I believe that a platform for zoology computation should be able to, you know, you should be able to run scripts in the background or have scheduled tasks or, you know, you should be able to just have a computation where you can just leave it to one side and you'd have to do everything manually. And finally, such a platform should be integrated. And what I mean by that is you should be able to <clears throat> you should be able to connect to external services or pull data from various libraries, you know, maybe browse the web and import and export data and essentially seamlessly uh, move between different platforms or even stay within just the one platform, you know, if it is complete enough. And what I'd like to do uh, for you today is demonstrate uh, how Mathematica can cover each of these goals. And I'm going to do that with um, a series of examples. So first of all, completeness. First, I should probably explain what I want to cover for zoology completeness. So that's anatomical data, agent-based simulation, bias statistics, time series forecasting, uh, you know, and just a, a whole lot more um, graphs and networks. We'll be covering that today. And not just that. So... You know, when you think of zoology, you might think of these things, but, you know, you're, you're mostly contained within uh, one area of science. But here at Wolfram, we like to think of, um, you know, that everything is connected. So if you have a platform that's complete in terms of zoology, it will also be complete or have, you know, you will also be able to connect to, say, aspects of geology or astronomy or mathematics or physics. Uh, chemistry, biology, you know, all of these things are interconnected and you should be able to uh, seamlessly go between them. And that's where the Wolfram knowledge base comes in. So Mathematica has a sort of whole collection of data that's already there. You know, it's nicely being curated for you. And, you know, that is what makes it this complete platform. Everything is just there at your fingertips. So for the first example, uh, just to demonstrate this completeness aspect of the language, of the Wolfram language, that is, uh, I'd like to look at some species. So as I mentioned, we have a Wolfram knowledge base and contained within this is, you know, so much data. Um, and a lot, it's the same data that powers Wolfram Alpha, which you may have seen online. And what we have, uh, we have within the language, these things called entities. That's what this orange box is. And these entities have various properties. Uh, and so, for example, if I were to uh, grab properties like that for a Western gorilla, you can see it has all these properties that can be extracted from that entity. And different entities have different properties. And when you insert an entity inside another function, that function um, automatically knows which, uh, you know, it automatically recognizes various properties and then can, you know, do the right computation based on those properties. So if we grab, um, if we grab the Western gorilla entity, we can, we can pull out the data set uh, property and see what its value is. So if I run that, there you go. So now I've got a nice data set of all the various things that I might want to know about a Western gorilla, such as an image of it, its family, you know, all these things are just built into the language right at your fingertips. We might want to look at the taxonomy graph. There you go. And all of these nodes are tooltipped, of course, tooltipped with other uh, entities. And what's, you know, perhaps, um, you know, if we wanted to do some analysis, we might compare the graph of the gorilla with a Komodo dragon. Why not? And that's very easy to do. So we literally just use graph union because all functions within the Wolfram language are named uh, aptly. And so we can take the graph union of those taxonomy, taxonomy graphs. And then I'm just setting a particular problem, a uh, property, sorry, for my preference, which is to add my own vertex labels. So 
here if I hover over them again I've got nice uh nice tool tips there so another problem we might want to solve is how do we you know how do we find the fastest animal in the world well that's not a problem uh, so if I'm going to be looking at the fastest mammals so first of all I can find all the entities within a particular entity class such that they are mammals and then I can take the largest or rather, you know, those that have the greatest maximum speed. And I'm going to take the largest 250. So I'm just finding the top 250 fastest mammals. So this is going to, so while that's running, that's just going to pull all this data from the Wolfram Knowledge Base, and it's going to all be in a nice format ready to go. Um, I'm going to try and visualize that data in a moment. But first, I might, I'm going to evaluate this just to see if it gives me something nice and it does it gives me a nice big old list there i was wondering if it'd be too large to fit on the screen but we're all good so again each of these is a nice entity which can be further analyzed the metadata extracted and so on so what i'm going to be doing is i'm going to be doing a list plot of these entities so i want to know the maximum speed of each one so i'm using entity value to pull out the maximum speed and I'm also pulling out the image and the name from each of them. And the reason why I'm getting the image and the name is because I am putting those into a tooltip. So as you can see, here are the top 250 fastest mammals based on, uh, you know, um, converted to miles per hour. And top result is a free-tailed bat. I was not expecting that. Uh, a different type of free-tailed bat is second. And a third bat is... Uh, there as well so apparently the top three are all bats not what i was expecting there you go so the cheetah is actually fourth place what do you know and in last place uh relatively speaking is the striped ground squirrel so yeah all that very easy to do really quick and easy um i mean this was all the code i needed to extract the actual mammal list and really all i needed to do to find to plot the data was this the rest of this is just options, just preference for style and appearance and things like that. So for my second example, to demonstrate the completeness of the Wolfram language in terms of zoo zoology computation is image recognition. <clears throat> so this is, we're slightly touching on um, the automated aspect of the language here. So, so suppose we have an image of some elephants and some zebras, and we wanted to pull out the key features so they might be trees or they might be rocks in the foreground, but I'm guessing uh, we're going to be really wanting the actual animals here. So what we can do is we can simply use image bounding boxes to automatically find the things that are considered to be interesting. And the way it does this automation is by using machine learning, but it's all handled in the background, already done for you, using pre uh, sort of pre-trained models. So in one line of code, I have now highlighted the elephants and the zebras in the photo. So really, really simple stuff. Of course, you can create your own models if you want. So we will be seeing classify, oh, whoops, classify uh, momentarily, but we also have things like uh, things like net chain and various other neural net capabilities within the language. Uh, in case you are interested. So you could make something like this yourself, but of course it would be a heck of a lot of effort. And why bother when we have it here in one simple function? And for my third and final example in this section, I'd like to talk about biotic interaction. So I'm first of all going to use a public resource function. Uh, so that's just a convenience um, in case you're not aware we have this thing called the Wolfram uh, function repository where users, uh, so members of the public, can submit their own functions. These users have made these functions and submitted them to this website to be then uh, shared publicly. So I can now, you know, this was submitted by uh, Joffrey by the looks of it, and I can download the source notebook. And let's have a look. Uh, I imagine it's gonna open full screen. No, it's okay, excellent. So this notebook here, I've now I can now see all his code and you know modify it, tweak it, do what I like. And so you know it's really it's uh, really really convenient to have all these publicly submitted functions. 
It's a great asset. So with that out of the way, I've got this public resource function. And first of all, I'm going to use this function to, let's see, to get all the interactions for a domestic cat. So we have domestic cat built into the language uh, already as an entity. And what I'm going to be doing is uh, picking, so I've got the, uh, so here's the graph of that. Now what I'm, I'm going to be doing is picking from the vertex list of that, uh, you know, from that graph, grabbing all the vertices and selecting the ones that are maximal in some respect. And that respect is the vertex out degree. So what I'm trying to do is find which one of these vertices or nodes has the most other uh, has the most edges coming from it. So it's probably this one, perhaps. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's not so easy to see by eye, but apparently the answer is squamata. So I'm guessing it's this one. So that was very, very easy to do. Just one line of code to do that. And I can do a bit more analysis. So I could look at the vertices that are up to three connections away from this uh, particular vertex. Um, so I've effectively obtained a subgraph now. And again, uh, all these Wolfram language functions are suitably named. It does what it says on the tin, nice and easy there. And then I can do some actual, uh, you know, some analysis or some computation on my graph. So I could find the shortest path, for example, uh, between two nodes. Uh, presumably these do exist in the graph. You know, these are ones I've selected earlier. And so this is the sequence of nodes that will take you from here to here in the shortest uh, path. Now, because this, I don't believe, is an edge-weighted graph, so it's just a you know a nice simple graph with uh, just vertices and edges, and then that's it. There's no edge weighting. There's no vertex weighting. This is simply going to be the shortest number of edges it takes to get from one node to the other. But it, you can incorporate edge weights if you like. Now. A final really convenient function when it comes to um, understanding large graphs, although you know these ones aren't particularly large, but they're reasonable, uh, a convenient thing to do is to look at the communities. So that is, uh, you know, sections of the graph that are locally, you know, they're either, they're either close or they're in a cluster or they're similar in some respect. And you can do this manually yourself. Um, so I believe it would require some sort of uh, highlighting with highlight graph perhaps. And you could manually do this clustering yourself, but it would be a bit of effort on your part um, and choosing the right algorithm to do so. So the fact that we have it automatically wrapped up in one function is really nice and neat. Um, and of course, this will have various options for appearance and layout and things like that if you want to tweak it. So that was a bit of, that was just a handful of, a handful of examples from different areas of zoology to show the completeness of the language. Now I'm going to be looking at some automation. And the standard uh, example for this would be to create a, me a uh, machine learning model. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing. It's going to be a very simple one. We're going to be using the classify function. This is the most basic you can get, but it's actually really powerful stuff. So Let's have a look at the data. So we have dromedary data and Bactrian data. So these are two types of camel. One that has, uh, let's see, yes, the dromedary has one hump and the camel has two. So the Bactrian camel has two. And I mean, yeah, most people probably aren't aware of this. I certainly wasn't before I wrote this talk. So I have a bunch of images here. If I uniconize this, you will see the list. Big old list of uh, dromedary camel camels there. Uh, all sorts of different sizes. They're not particularly, uh, well, they're reasonably clean images, mostly. This one has two in it. That one has a fence in it. That one's a cuddly toy. So they're not the best, but that's not to worry because with enough data, the noise um, usually you know, matters less and less. So we can grab random samples from each of these to have a look. This one has writing in it. So that's probably a meme. Uh, that's not great. But that's that's where our classifier comes in. How can we, you know, can we get around that? So if you were to create your own neural net, you would need to construct matrices, layer, you know, look up, uh, you'd need to sort out what layers are needed. So if this, um, you know, if this is familiar to you, I'm sure you're 
you'll be aware of how difficult it can be to choose the right layers. Uh, you'll need a lot of data as well. Uh, but all that is easily handled by our classify function. So this has a this is a super function. It has a lot of um, models pre-built into it. It's pre-trained on a heck of a lot of data. And so what we can do is we can simply insert an association where we say, I'm going to label the Bactrian data with the word Bactrian and the dromedary data with the word dromedary. And if I evaluate this, this both creates and trains a classifier model. So this pre-processes the, pre the data. It might take a couple of seconds to actually run the model. So we have a reasonable amount of data here. So it might take a little while to do both of those steps. But the fact is, it's all automated. So, you know, typically, um, I mean, I say these might take a little while. I'm talking tens of seconds to a minute or something. But, you know, typically, if you've ever made a machine learning model before, then you'll know that these things, you usually leave them to run for several minutes, hours, days even. Um, so here we are. Here is our classifier running. As you can see, it's currently been running for 45 seconds. So it included the pre-processing there. It's automatically using logistic regression, and it's about 160 examples of the way through. There we go. So here is our classifier. It's wrapped up in this nice little classifier function object. I can see inside. I can see you know, a bit more about it. <clears throat> I can actually, although I won't be doing it here, you can uh, use the function classifier measurements to measure the function against uh, test data to see how well it works. But for our purposes, we're just going to test it against two example images. And there you go. Brand new images, it's never seen them before. It's only had a couple of hundred images as its input data, and already it's able to distinguish the two. Now we could also have a look at its probabilities as well. So if I were to insert one of these images, I could, as a second argument, ask for the probabilities like so. And as you can see, uh, its identification was dromedary, but, uh, and yes, it was very, very confident about that result. So it was over 98% confident about that. So that's good. That shows that that model is probably pretty, uh, it's probably a reasonably good model. Um, if it were absolutely 100% certain, I'd be a bit skeptical. Uh, and if it were uncertain, then I would be thinking, you know, perhaps I need to improve my model in some way. So that was completeness and automation. And finally, I'd like to talk about integration. So how can Mathematica be, how can uh, Mathematica be incorporated, integrated with other services or other data sets, things like that? And my example here is going to be incorporation with videos. So videos are a recent uh, thing that we have inserted into the Wolfram language. And so now you can seamlessly take your own video data and conduct an, an analysis on it. And uh, we actually very recently, uh, uh, we recently uh, actually brought out a lot of new functions actually for video. So if I do this, uh, I can actually see exactly all the, you know, all the functions that we do have on video. So there you go. A lot of these are fairly recent functions. And so let's see what we can do. So we have an example data video. So this is a sort of side note here, but this is one aspect of the integration that we have with uh, data sets, because this data here, you know, this uh, bullfinch video, um, I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to go hunting for it on the web, anything like that. It's just built into the language. It's just there. So it makes doing any testing really convenient to have example data at your fingertips. So I'm just going to mute it uh, so that it um, doesn't, uh, let's see, so that it doesn't mess with our uh, webinar here. So there's, a, there's a, a bird, it's chirping away. And let's see what we can do about it. So. First of all, we're going to extract uh, the, f oh, so we're only gonna be looking at the first second of video. Presumably that's just to um, to reduce computation time because of course videos are a lot more computationally expensive than just images because you have a lot of frames in videos, 24 frames per second typically. So 
these sort of computations can take a little while to run. So what I'm doing here is I'm trimming the video down to its first frame, and then I'm extracting a list of all the frames. So we're probably going to have 24 images, but I mean, I'm not sure. Then I'm going to highlight the image where, uh, so I'm looking for uh, special cases and I'm highlighting the image. So basically I'm doing what we did for the elephants and the zebras, but I'm doing it per frame in this video. And then I'm grabbing all those frames together and generating a new video. So all those steps are done in one line and let's see what we get. So there you go. So there's our one bird highlighted, but also kept highlighting. So, you know, we're maintaining our bounding box for the duration of the video. And this is the sort of thing that self-driving cars can do if they have um, image uh, sort of uh, tracking technology built in. So if they're not using LiDAR, but if they're using, um, you know, video imagery analysis, then this is the sort of thing that they do, except they will try to do that in real time uh, so, that they, so that they don't crash. So we can do a slightly different computation this time. This time I'm going to be finding the position of the uh, bird for every frame. And this time I, I'm making a video map time series. So I do care about uh, the timing now. So a time series is just a, you know, it's just data, except there's a, there's a timestamp on every data point. And so let's have a look. So there you go. So this is what I've done here is if I, I have extracted the first five frames of videos uh, from the video. I have put a point at every, uh, you know, at uh, all of these bird positions, and then I've highlighted those points. So this is where the bird goes for the first five frames of the video. So, you know, there's the bounding box around the bird, take the center of it. So as you can see, the bounding box moves around a bit. This is how that bounding box moves around. And of course, you could do that for the entirety of the video if you wanted. And what might be interesting to you is to plot the magnitude of the movement so that you could see, you know, just how much it moved from one frame to the next. There you go. Nice and easy to do just with a list line plot. OK, so hopefully I've demonstrated to you how Mathematica, uh, when it comes to zoology computation, is a complete, highly automated, and integrated platform. Now, if you have any more questions, if you'd like to uh, learn more about the Wolfram language, I've given you some links and some references as well. Thank you very much for coming, and have a nice day.